Caitlin, the last time did you um, start right at noon or did you do like a few minutes of wiggle room? We gave a few minutes. We started probably at three minutes after. Okay. And we can do the same this time too. Cool. Cool, cool. Hi, everybody. Hi, Caitlin. Hi. Hi. How are you, Jenny? I'm good. How are you? Good. Good. You're <laughs> welcome. Thank Hi, you. everyone. Hello. Hello. Looks like we're still waiting for some people to join. I think there were about 25 signed up last time I checked. Awesome. That's great. How are you guys doing with the garden planning and whatnot amid COVID? <laughs> Jenny and Kate, I'm curious how your lives have changed a little bit. Yeah, I mean, one of the things isn't garden related, but just um, a lot of the communication stuff um, mm -hmm. Kate and I have taken on just with, we, you know, we're serving food to children. Mm -hmm. We just crossed our 1 million meals marker yesterday. We wow. almost made it on Friday. We were like about 500 meals short. So, awesome. um, uh, so, so there's, there, there's those new things that we're, we're doing as, as well. So, yeah. but I think people are excited about gardening and, and also like walking and biking, like the kind of some of these things that you still can do and kind of, you know, you're able to socially distance, you know, exactly. without too much trouble when you're outside and I don't know if you are safer but it sure feels safer when there's yeah. fresh air everywhere compared to mm -hmm. it really know. does I was at Bancroft Elementary the other night and they were um, handing out trees from the um, Family of Trees Foundation and they had um, lunches that they were handing out too and it was so cool to see all the families stopping by and picking them up and which is cool so was yeah, it our boxes so cool. was it like yeah. between 10 and 2 oh yeah that's yep. awesome yep. cool yeah and they were <laughs> handing out trees that's awesome yeah, I think Kira Christensen through the mentorship program, she's um, working with the Family of Trees program, and I think it's just a side project that she does, but as families would come and pick up their lunches, she would hand them a tree if they wanted it. It was really cool. Oh my cool. gosh. Yeah. That is so cool. It was. She's so excited to get her planting boxes from, uh, from you guys. I think she's getting those hydroponic tables, and uh, she showed me where she wants to put them, and it's going to be such a cool little garden space when she gets it started. Do you, you mean the, the raised garden beds that, but they're, that aren't, I'm um, sadly coming right now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and she I didn't know if they had plans for other things as well. We've talked about it a little bit. It looks like they've got some really nice landscaping already around the area that they don't really want to step on too much, but, um, but yeah, they're getting ready for the garden beds and they're excited for it. Cool. That's great. Yeah. Hello, everybody else that's joining. Uh, you might notice your screen is muted automatically as you join, but if you'd like to unmute yourself and give a little introduction, uh, feel free. I'm Caitlin with SparkWide. It's about noon now, but we'll wait maybe two or three more minutes just as people start to join us.
Hello and welcome to those of you who are just joining us. Uh, we're going to get started in just a couple minutes here. So hang tight. If you'd like to unmute yourself and uh, give a little introduction, feel free to do that. Hi, I'm Jenny Borden. I'm part of the Culinary and Wellness Services um, team. I'm working on student wellness, including school gardens. Thanks, Jenny. And I'm Julie Danzel, also with Minneapolis Public Schools um, and on the wellness team and, and school gardens is also one of the things I get to work on. Hi, Julie. Thanks so much for joining us. Hi, Caitlin. <laughs> I can jump in next since I work with Jenny and Julie, but Kate Siebold, Farm to School Coordinator for MPS um, and involved with school garden work. Um, hi, Kate. And it looks like we've got quite a few people signed on now. So we're going to get started and anybody else that joins us might still jump on. Um, this is the second webinar in a series, Garden Program Planning. And today we're going to go over some resources, funding opportunities, getting volunteers on board with school gardens, and just some gardening tips and tricks. Um, and this webinar is presented through a partnership with Minneapolis Public Schools Culinary and Wellness Services and Spark Y. Um, and you just met some of the Culinary and Wellness Service team. My name is Caitlin. I'm the Sustainability and Agriculture direct Director with Spark Y. And I'm joined today with some of my coworkers. Hi, everybody. My name is Sarah. I am the Lead Sustainability Educator at Spark Y. And hello, everybody. My name is Nick Walker. I am one of Spark Y's Sustainability Educators. Awesome. So I think many of you were probably on our last webinar and probably have heard about SparkY before. But for those of you who haven't, SparkY is a youth education nonprofit, and we focus primarily on uh, providing sustainability and STEM education in the classroom. So right now we're working with, I want to say it's about a dozen schools across the Twin Cities. And traditionally, we usually reach about 1,500 youth annually. And uh, as I said before, this webinar was presented uh, through a partnership that we've got right now with the Culinary and Wellness Services and Spark Y. And so through that partnership, we're able to provide some of these educational resources to the school gardening community in Minneapolis. Um, we're also doing a mentorship program with a couple schools this year. And we're uh, working on managing the garden that's in front of the Culinary and Wellness Services building. If you haven't been out there, it's about a 3,500 square foot raised garden space. It's beautiful. Um, and we usually bring a lot of tours and field trips through that space during the summer. So hopefully, or end school year too, but hopefully when things go back to normal with the whole COVID thing, um, we can start to do that some more. So if you are interested in bringing some students through that garden, feel free to reach out to me or to um, Kate and we can get that scheduled for you. And now that you guys have um, learned a little bit about us, we've got a little poll. We want to learn a little bit about who's joining us on this webinar. So you're going to see a little screen pop up in a minute. And if you can just choose which one kind of describes you the best, um, we're just asking what is your involvement with school gardens. So you can choose that you manage or oversee a school garden, you support or volunteer with a school garden, that could be parents, students, anybody, um, a community member that would like to learn more about school gardens, or you work with MPS on an administrative level or maybe you're not involved with a school garden at all. So just click on whichever one you'd like, and then Nick is uh, figuring out how many people have uh, already <laughs> signed on. So in just a minute, we'll show you the results. We'll give about 15 more seconds. Sounds good. Yep. All right. Ooh, looks like we've got a really good spread here. Um, most of you support or volunteer with the school garden. I know that that's the one I chose. I support school gardens. Um, but it looks like we've got a good percentage of people who manage and oversee school gardens and people who are working with MPS on an admin level. And then it's good to know that there's not anybody who's not involved with a school garden in some way. They're fun to be involved with, so it's good to know. 
Awesome, thank you all for doing that. We'll have one more poll at the end. So just a few housekeeping things. Today we're gonna to go over some local gardening resources, um, ways that you can find tools and uh, education and seeds, that kind of thing. Some funding opportunities uh, for school gardens, and those funding opportunities can also relate to community gardens and other types of gardens as well. So if that relates more to you, um, that section should be good. Um, getting volunteers on board for school gardens, and then tips for summer maintenance. Um, and then at the very end, we'll have a question and answer session. And just a few uh, logistics as we get started. Uh, we are recording this webinar and we'll be posting it online at sparkwa.org afterwards, probably by about the end of the week or early next week. So I can send a link uh, to this webinar to everybody that signed up on our sign up list. Um, and you might have noticed you were automatically muted as you joined the webinar. Uh, at the very end, I'll show you how you can unmute yourself to answer or to ask a question during the question and answer. But we do ask that you remain muted throughout the webinar so that we don't get any odd noises. Um, and then if you do have a question during the webinar, if you kind of use your mouse to go to the bottom of your screen, there's a chat function. And if you click on that, another box will pop up. You can type your message in there and I will be responding to the chats uh, throughout the webinar. And then at the very end, there's a raise hand feature that I'll show you so you can raise your hand and ask a question during question and answer. So to get us started, I think Kate's got a couple of um, announcements through APS. Yes, great. Hi, everyone. Um, so again, I work for MPS Culinary and Wellness Services um, and am a part of our uh, department's wellness team. So thank you, everyone, for joining for the webinar today. We're excited to be able to partner with SparkY again for this virtual training. Um, so as you might have seen in the promotions that were sent out for this webinar that we are going to be raffling off some free plants today for school gardens. Um, so these plants were donated by the city of Minneapolis as well as Spark Y. Um, so at the end of the webinar, we will be, um, again, yeah, drawing, drawing names for the schools for you to win a tray of free plants. Um, so it, we have a variety of plants. Each school that's selected will be getting a mix of, of plants, including some tomatoes, Swiss chard, cucumber, herbs, um, peppers, etc. cetera. Um, so if you are representing a MPS school garden, either as a volunteer, a parent, a staff member, and you would like to enter your school in for this plant raffle, what we're gonna ask you to do is go into the chat box on this and um, You'll see here, I put an example, just type in the word raffle and then list your name, email address and your school site. And we will use that to enter you into the drawing. Um, if there are multiple people here who are all representing the same school garden, you can each enter once, um, but one person can't enter more than one time for the drawing. Um, and then, yeah, just hang out here till the end of the webinar and we'll be drawing them. And then uh, MPS Culinary and Wellness Services staff will be delivering those plants to your school tomorrow afternoon. So um, those of you who are selected can expect an email from me later today where I'll just ask you to reply with some details about where your garden is located on your school property and um, where you would like the plants left. So we're excited to, um, to have these plants to share with you. So again, just go into the chat function and enter in your information if your school would like to be entered in for the drawing. And then if you can just go to the next, oh, perfect. Um, and so then the other thing we just wanted to mention um, is that MPS Culinary and Wellness Services has launched our very first Junior Iron Chef at Home Edition. Um, so some of you may be familiar with our annual Junior Iron Chef competition that happens every spring, usually in person, um, where we have middle schoolers team up with local chefs and it's a really fun cooking competition. Uh, this year we are doing an at-home edition um, and it, it is a little different in that all children 18 and under are invited to participate. So basically how it works is we are encouraging, um, again, any child 18 or under to participate in this competition where they um, are to create and submit a recipe um, from home that is inspired by ingredients in MPS food boxes, which um, MPS food boxes are available um, at 
50 pickup sites across the city, um, Monday through Friday. And again, they're free and available for any child 18 and under. So um, a kid can go pick up a food box and then um, use some of the ingredients in that box to come up with a recipe of their own. Um, they only have to include two ingredients from their food box and they can get really creative. Um, Recipe submissions are due June 1st, and um, three finalists will have their recipes prepared on camera um, by some of our MPS chefs, and then one, uh, one lucky uh, finalist will be named our new Junior Iron Chef Champion and win a prize. Um, so this is a really fun way to just inspire some creative cooking at home, so please, um, if you personally have children at home, we encourage you to participate, um, but also please help us share this fun opportunity with, um, with children and family in our community. So more information is available on um, the Culinary and Wellness Services website. The link to the Junior Iron Chef webpage is here on screen. Um, you can also go to our Facebook page um, and get more information there. But um, yeah, help spread the word. Recipes are due June 1st for our new Junior Iron Chef Champion. Excellent, so I'm gonna take over from here for a little bit. And a big part of this webinar is just talking about some of the resources that are available locally here in Minneapolis. We've kind of split this up into a few different categories. And this first category that I want to talk about is tools. So for anybody that was part of the first webinar that Sparkfly did, it was a lot about planning a garden and how to prep and get ready for the start of the season. Um, if you weren't able to get that webinar, as Caitlin mentioned, it is available on our website and we super encourage you to check that out. It's got a lot of great information. And so we wanted to include some tool resources on here because for anybody that is involved with gardening in any capacity, whether it's at a school or at home. Tools are a huge necessity. Um, some of them can be kind of hard to come by. Others can be really expensive. And so we wanted to include a couple of really awesome resources. This first one, I'm gonna ask Nick to click on the link here, is the Minnesota Tool Library. It is one of my favorite things that I have ever found in my entire history of living in Minneapolis. Um, so it is, really local, it's in Northeast area in the Thorpe building, in case anybody is familiar with that sort of arts district area. Um, and this is a really, really cool resource. It's a, they have a physical location. You can go in, um, sign up for a membership. I think their memberships are a year long and they're pretty fairly inexpensive. Um, and even if the expense is an issue, we are also talking in, in a short while about some funding and grant opportunities and several of those opportunities could help to cover the cost of this. But essentially, this is a very cool space there. You can go in and it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a library. So they've got tools upon tools of all different kinds. You know, I, I've seen screwdrivers of every shape and size and saws and hammers and everything. But the, the best part is they also have a lot of really sort of niche tools available. Things like tillers and dandelion pullers and bigger pieces of equipment that again might be really hard to come by or really expensive if you're trying to buy them on your own and so you can go check them out for I believe it's two weeks at a time and then you just bring it back and return it when you're done um, check out I think you can check out up to five different tools at a time um, and it's a very helpful resource and the people that work there are so kind and helpful and I definitely recommend it to everybody um, whether you're doing a tool garden or not, it's just a great resource to use. So going back to our page here, another source that I found recently that I'm going to ask Nick to click on the link of is this Minneapolis Garden Swap Group. So for those of you that have a Facebook page, this is a really cool place to go. It's just a lot of local gardeners around the Minneapolis area. Um, I scrolled through myself a little bit and am constantly seeing posts for um, people that have extra plants and seeds available that they want to share with others or tools that they're trying to donate or sell um, or uh, just asking for advice or asking for, hey, I need a tiller and I really do need to borrow it for a weekend. Um, anybody have one that I can use? So especially for access to tools, this could be a really great resource 
just connecting with other gardeners in the area that are super down to help each other out. And the last thing that I wanted to suggest is kind of along that line, just networking with other gardeners in your area, especially from what we saw from the poll, everybody in this webinar currently is in some capacity involved with school gardens. And um, I know personally, I manage a school garden over at Edison High School, and I've got tons of stuff available that we've collected over the last few years and would be more than happy to loan them out to somebody. Um, it, I feel like that's probably a pretty common feeling. So just network with other people in the area, especially others that are working on school gardens. Let's help each other out and let's, let's work as a team to make these gardens as beautiful and successful as we can. So our next page um, of resources that I've broken up is the category plants and seeds. Especially right now, this is the time when we're all starting to plant our gardens. You know, we just hopefully passed that last frost date. Um, I don't think that we're at much risk anymore. The weather's been so beautiful today. So getting ready to actually plant um, and getting access to those things, it can be difficult. Again, it can be kind of expensive depending on how much you're trying to do. So a few great sources that I found, um, Nick's gonna click on this first one here for the Como Community Seed Library. I did choose to link their Facebook page here as opposed to their official website, which they do have. So you're super welcome to go and check that out. Um, but what I, I noticed was that their website seemed to be a little bit more out of date, especially as far as their events went. Uh, there were several events that I saw posted on the website that were actually dating back to last season. But their Facebook page seems to be really up to date and includes all the new events that are happening um, and all the new information. So this is a, a great resource for um, just getting seeds for, they work together with a lot of other partners and a lot of farmers and growers and gardeners that will bring seeds that are, they're just willing to share. Um, I think it's really cool in this picture up along the top, you can tell that they also often have some really cool plants and seeds that you might not just find in a Home Depot or something like that, like Thai chili peppers and strawberry popping corn. And so especially if you're working with students that are looking for some neat varieties, I, every year that I'm planting my garden with students, I always ask them what they want to plant and some of them come up with these like really off the wall ideas. And I think it's cool to grow things that they're not used to seeing. So I love encouraging that. And this is a really cool space to find some of those plants and seeds. Um, and then similarly, back on our slide page over here is the Little Seed Library, which is located in Eden Prairie, but it's not too terribly far. It's very similar if you guys are familiar with the, the little tiny libraries that you walk around the neighborhood and they look like a little birdhouse and they're full of books. It's basically the same concept. It's like a little free book library, but instead they, you can see from this picture that Nick is gonna circle around with the cursor. Um, you can see that there's just Tupperware containers of different seeds that people will put in there when they have, or that uh, I believe some of them come from like parks in the area and stuff like that. There is a list right off to the left, is that the left? Yeah, to the left of that picture that says what is in that library right now. So these are typically more like pollinator friendly plants and perennials and things like that. But I know a lot of school gardens either are pollinator gardens or at least have a pollinator um, component to them. And that's also including those plants is a really cool teaching experience for students because of how important pollinators are. And if you're looking to encourage some of that ecosystem and growth, this could be a really uh, neat resource and also just a, a cool thing to, to talk with students about, about how it's really helpful when we all work as a team and share what we have and share our seeds. So that's a fun one that I'm excited to go through this summer. Um, another local uh, business that we really love at Sparkly and we've worked with them a lot in the past is Mother Earth Garden. They are um, just a small local nursery and they also do focus a lot more on things like flowers and perennials and pollinator friendly 
plants as opposed to things like fruits and vegetables. But we just love working with them. I've worked with them a lot in the past and they're always super friendly and super helpful. They're often pretty open and willing to um, help out with schools and I've had plants donated from them in the past. So we love supporting local businesses, especially during this crazy time of COVID where everything's a little wonky. I would much rather support a small local business like this and they're very great people from over. And the next one, um, we don't necessarily have to click on this one right now, we could, but um, it also is gonna come up again later. Our Spark Y virtual victory garden. No, actually, this is a different, we should do this. We should click on this one. I, I got the links mixed up in my head. Um, but we, over at Spark Y, have started these very, very cool virtual victory gardens um, that can be purchased. And you'll see in the kit details, it explains what comes in the kit. Um, there's a variety of vegetables and seed, uh, vegetable plants and seed packets. But the really cool part about what we're doing with these Victory Gardens is that for every kit that we sell, we're also able to provide one free kit to a family or a local community member in Northeast that is in need of um, some fresh, healthy produce to grow at their home. And so this is a, a really cool community involvement thing that we're able to do that's helping people grow some food and be resilient in their, in their lives and their homes, but also provide that to people that are in need. Um, so definitely, if you have more questions about these at the end, um, or even right now, Caitlin is in the chat feature and is happy to answer those. Um, or if you have questions at the end, you'll definitely be able to give you more information. Um, I have also personally had a lot of luck in the past with just reaching directly out to seed companies. I know several of these resources that we've listed so far have been kind of more oriented towards things like pollinator plants and perennials and flowers. But if you are more in the market for food plants, um, fruits and vegetables and greens and stuff like that, and are looking to get a bunch of seeds, um, a lot of seed companies are open and willing to donate for free seeds from the previous season. So seeds that are still perfectly fine and are gonna plant and grow just perfectly um, it's just that because they're from last season, they're not being sold anymore. So all four of the companies that I've listed here, Johnny Seeds, Heimling Organic Seeds, Botanical Interest, and Burpee, um, I've personally reached out to them to get seed donations in the past, and it's pretty easy. Most of them either just email their contact um, that's listed on their website inquiring about donations, or there's sometimes a form, a donation form, that you just fill out, um, especially working with schools, if you put the name of your school that they're going through, they're very happy and willing to, to donate to those gardens. So that's a great, a great place to reach out to. But the same also goes for local nurseries and businesses. A lot of them will be willing to donate seeds from old seasons or even some current plants that um, they're able to just you know, spare a little and, and donate a a bit of plant for their school garden and for a good cause like that. So definitely reach out to local places um, and these seed companies are a great source too. So you can get a lot all at one time. And then again, just networking with other gardeners. You know, the Facebook group that was listed before is probably a great place. Other people that are just in, um, oh, it looks like we have Minnesota Green. Oh, a program of the state work site. Cool. Um, so somebody just recommended joining uh, a place or an organization called Minnesota Green. So it's not one I've heard of, but definitely something worth looking into. Thank you for that. So but yeah, we can keep going to our third category, which is information. We don't need to necessarily uh, go to every one of these links because Nick very kindly took the time to look into each of these on his own and write some very helpful descriptive um, summaries of them, but these are just some really awesome different organizations and and like sites and places that you can go to get whatever information you might need. Homegrown Minneapolis is again something that uh, Spark Y has worked with a lot in the past. 
there's a lot of information there about food and food systems and growing and sustainability. Um, Growers Network is a lot of people, a lot of gardeners and growers coming together to just share their knowledge. Um, it's a great place to go and ask questions, especially if you're maybe newer to the world of gardening or you're considering yourself more of a beginner or novice. Great place to ask questions. The new event extension program has information on just tons and tons of topics from everything from actually just growing fruits and vegetables to things that impact the health of your garden like water conservation and soil health and um, nutrients and all kinds of things like that so if you're looking for more research um, it's also a great resource to use if you're trying to tie some of that knowledge into classrooms for example um, at Edison with the garden that I work at I also help teach a environmental science class every day and so we're constantly trying to figure out how can we tie working in our garden into some of the environmental science stuff we want to teach so we'll do soil health units and water conservation units and all kinds of stuff like that and it's a great source to get um, topic information from uh, another one that i love is sustag it's a listserv that if you go on their website you can just uh, add your email and sign up for the service and then you'll get a ton of emails about things like workshops and courses that you can take that revolve around agriculture and sustainability. There are posts about volunteer opportunities and um, events that are going on. And another cool thing about being part of this listserv is that if you ever have something you want to get the word out about, maybe you're doing a fundraiser event to raise money for your garden or something, you can submit that to Sustag and have that email sent out to everybody else that's on the listserv to try and spread the word about whatever it is that you might be doing or that you might want to uh, get some information out about. And um, last one, maybe Nick can click on this link, is um, again to the SparkY website. So along with us actually selling Victory Garden Kits, another component of that is that we've made a series of informational videos. So our staff has worked very, very hard together to put together, to make these videos about different topics. You'll see there's a short video about starting seeds and a short video about how to do crop rotation. So uh, these can be really helpful. Um, they're nice and short and easily digestible. So a very great place to go. Okay, switching gears now. Now that we've talked about resources, we are going to talk quickly about funding. Um, the first thing that we're going to show you before we click on this link, though, is I found this amazing website called Growing Spaces. And on their website, they have this huge list of grants. Um, I just want to point out before we show, show you that list that they, they are from all across the country. Some of them might not be applicable to uh, people in our area. For example, um, Nick, maybe you can go ahead and click that link now for us. And you'll see one of the first ones that we see near the top here is Colorado Garden Foundation. That's not going to be particularly helpful to anyone growing a garden in Minnesota, and we probably would not qualify for that grant. But this, you can just take a quick scroll and see that this list is very extensive and long, and most of these grants next to the link have a short description of what they what they are or who qualifies for them so it's a pretty, pretty easy way so the teaching garden um, through the american heart association one is one that we really like and wanted to highlight you can see that it's grants specifically for implementing gardens into schools so that is something that many of us and many of our schools would qualify for Another amazing one is these Home Depot grants that the cursor is right there next to you now. Um, Home Depots are everywhere and there's plenty of them here around Minneapolis. These grants are uh, typically gr uh, granted for things like tools and equipment that you might need to use in your garden. Um, Sparkly and Edison have both gotten one of these Home Depot grants before um, for the Edison Garden, we were able to use that money to 
buy ourselves a whole uh, mess of shovels and rakes and hoes and hand travel and we were able to purchase enough tools that we're able to have all of our students that are in the environmental science class working in the garden at the same time without anybody having to stand up to the side and be bored. So anyway, the main point here is that this is an incredible, concise resource for just tons and tons of grants that are available. They are all up to date. You'll see it says Grants 2020. So everything that's on this list is the most up-to-date version of it. And we totally encourage you to just scroll through, um, take a quick scan and see what you might be qualified for. But definitely any that you are particularly interested in, click the links, read a little bit more, do a little extra research to make sure that your, you and your school are a good fit for it. And then go ahead and apply. So you wanna go, um, and I did make a little note here that I've done this in the past and it seems to be really successful. If you are going to apply for a grant, we definitely encourage you to reach out to other stakeholders in your garden. Partner teachers are a great resource because they might know more information about the school itself and be able to help you with that. Um, parents and community members that are really involved are usually super open and happy to help on the grant writing process. And students are such an amazing resource. I've written grants before with Edison students and had them put their own voice and words into it, saying how, you know, these are the, these are the kids that are gonna be impacted by this grant and having them say what that impact is gonna be, I think was really powerful and we were able to get quite a bit of money for our supporting our garden because of that. Um, so I definitely encourage getting students involved. Um, other funding opportunities that we thought of or fundraising opportunities. These are just a couple of ideas that we had that we've done that have worked in the past. So hosting some kind of event where you're potentially featuring something from your garden. So if you're growing a lot of food and produce in your garden, is there something that can be harvested that you can make a quick little dish out of? If you're growing a lot of things like tomatoes and peppers, maybe you can harvest them and make a little salsa dish or um, if you have more of a pollinator flower garden, harvest some of the flowers and make little bouquets. And these are things that people coming to your event can taste test or take a sample of or buy if, um, if you have enough to be doing that. And, and that's a good way to draw people in, but also raise a little bit extra funds. And then, uh, of course, getting students involved again. Any students that are going to be involved in the garden, I'm such a big fan of keeping them involved in every aspect of it. So have them uh, work together to make things. One of our Edison classes um, worked together to make some pollinator houses recently and are planning, to, we were planning to sell them this year. Um, unfortunately, we might not be getting to that, but they are there and they're done and they're sitting in our classroom storage right now. So we are hoping that when we get back to school, we'll be able to do a fun little marketing project and sell those pollinator houses with all of that money going back into their garden. So um, we, those are just a couple ideas we had. Um, please let us know during the Q&A if you have other ideas or have done things in the past that were really successful for you. So we can move on now. And the last section that I want to talk about is volunteers. Uh, if you, again, were at the first uh, webinar, we talked a lot about garden planning and getting started for the season. And again, if you weren't there, if you came in late, um, please, we definitely encourage you to check out that first webinar. It was really informative and it is available on the Starkwide website right now. So volunteers can be such a, a necessary, honestly, a necessary part in and making your garden successful. I think gardens require a lot of TLC and a lot of work and it can often be really overwhelming if just one person is trying to provide all of that TLC. So recruit volunteers and the people that are going to be the best to, to do that and to help you out with that are people like co-teachers and other school staff. I know a lot of staff at the school I work at that are really excited about helping out because they see the garden, they're there every day and they see it and they see students interacting with it and what a good impact it can be. And they want to help make that successful, so reach out to them. Um, same with parents and other community members. 
There are so many people that just want these projects to be successful and are more than happy to help out. And then of course, once again, because I'm the biggest fan of getting students involved, students make the best volunteers. So there might be students who just want to volunteer on an individual basis and help out, but it's also a great idea to advertise around the school, especially to particular clubs and organizations that might want to get involved as a whole team. There's a lot of schools that have things like a green team or a sustainability team or an outdoors club and activities like this are a great way to get a whole group of students involved at one time, especially if you have bigger tasks or events that require a lot of people volunteering. And the second bullet point that I added may not be entirely possible for everybody, but if it is, it's something that I have used and have had a lot of success with, um, offering some sort of academic incentive if you're able to. So for my environmental science students, my co-teacher and I are able to, and we've chosen to offer some extra credit points to any students that want to come do additional garden work during their study hall time or during after school time. And it's a, a nice, easy way to get students involved and, and students tend to, you know, if there's a little bit of something extra in it for them, um, you know, pretty, pretty apt to, to take on a little extra work and or maybe sign up for an extra shift here and there. All right, so next. Almost done. I know you've been listening to me talk for a very long time. Um, it's how to use those volunteers. So again, if you were in that first webinar, we talked a lot about you know getting started and making a garden plan and knowing what you need to get done. And volunteers are a great place to to fill those holes. So if you have already worked on your garden plan and you know what are all the things that need to get done, especially on a regular basis, things like weeding, watering, harvesting, those happen all throughout the summer, um, all the time. And then there are also tasks that are gonna happen only at the start of the season or only at the end of the season that might require a bit more hands-on deck, it might be a little bit more intensive. And using volunteers to fill all of these holes is so helpful. Again, it is a huge effort and basically impossible, I think, for one person to take it on themselves. My garden would not be beautiful and successful if I was the only one who was taking care of it. Um, we encourage you that when you do have volunteers, to keep a record of them. Um, it's great, a great source to start an email chain if you have the capacity to do that or any time a task becomes available. So whether it's a regular task that's happening, say, on a weekly or bi-weekly basis, or just a one-time thing comes up like, we need to winterize our garden and we're gonna spend, you know, this Monday afternoon doing it when it gets to be later in the fall. You can send out an email chain, everybody gets the message all at once and they can sign up for, um, or let you know if they're available to do that. And consider also using something like a Google Calendar or a Google Form or a spreadsheet to keep track of things and to allow your volunteers to sign up for things. Uh, Google Calendar, I think, is also a really awesome thing to use because you can start specifically a volunteer calendar and share just that calendar with anyone that is wanting to volunteer at your garden. And anytime things come up like, hey, we need somebody to go water on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday of this week, you can put it on the calendar and anyone that sees it can then just click on that link and sign up for it or send you an email and say, hey, I can come by on Wednesday afternoon and do it um, or whatever that may be. Um, and if Nick goes to the next slide here, I did make just like some quick little examples of how I keep track of things for my garden. So the first one up at the top is just an example of how I would keep track of the, my volunteers in general. Um, I've used our names and um, some fake emails and phone numbers. But another thing I really like to include in this information is that person's connection to the garden. So whether it's me who is managing the garden or somebody who is a teacher at the school or a student in, in a particular class or a parent of a student, um, that's some really great information to include. And then this bottom one down here of how do you keep track of these things? There's a lot of ways that this could be done. There's so, so many different methods that you can use and please find whatever is gonna work best for you. This is a way that I 
have found works for me. So I separate my uh, tasks by when in the year they need to happen. The ongoing ones will be stuff that happens all the time throughout the season. And then uh, I just list my dates along the top. And anytime a volunteer reaches out and says, oh yeah, I can go. Um, Abby emailed me the other day and said that she could go till the soil this afternoon. So I put her name in tilling soil in 519-320. And I know that that job is taken care of and it doesn't have to be worried about that. Okay. I think that's about all that I have. So I'm going to hand it over to Nick. And please, uh, if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them during the q Excellent. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so we're going to be switching gears here into some summer gardening tips. So we'll start off with uh, what to plant and when to plant. So starting off with things like tomatoes, bell peppers, cucumbers, things like that. We want to have them started indoors um, because if we start them outside too soon, as we've seen here before, the frost can still come in even halfway through May. And if we plant them outside too early, um, that frost can uh, take out those plants. So we want to start them inside and then move them outside after that final frost, which May 15th is usually a safe bet to be able to start moving them outside. Um, however, for other hardier plants like peas and kale, um, those can be planted outside much earlier in the season, April and May, they can survive those frosts. As for watering, we recommend watering in the morning or in the evening. Um, if you can, it'd be preferred to water it in the morning um, because if you water during the day, um, it's much less efficient as all that water will evaporate much quicker as it's much hotter outside. And also sometimes plants can get a little bit of heat damage if you um, tend to water them. The water can act almost like a magnifying glass and kind of uh, burn the plants a little bit sometimes. So highly recommend watering in the morning or in the evening. And when possible, be sure to water your plants at the base down towards the roots um, because we wanna make sure all that water gets to the roots um, or as much water gets to the roots as possible. So watering over the top, over the foliage, sometimes not all of that water can get down to the roots. Um, so be sure to try to get to the stem and uh, water down there when possible. And also try to water more heavily and more intermittently to support strong, deep root growth. Um, so if you water a lot heavier, that water will soak much more deeper or deeply into the soil. And so those plants, those roots will have to dig really, really deep to uh, reach down and get to that water. But if you're watering uh, much more often and just a little bit of sprinkling of water over the top, the roots don't have to reach as deep. So they're much shallower and there isn't a lot of uh, support for those plants. So you wanna want all of your plants to have that really deep root growth. So we'll continue on and talk about those pesky Japanese beetles. Um, so if you see a lot of beetles coming in, um, killing them with, uh, with beetle traps or squishing them um, is not actually a good idea because the beetles will release these pheromones, um, which will actually attract more beetles to come to your garden. So to combat this, a nifty little uh, tool you can do is you can actually take a two liter bottle, like you can see here on the right, take a two liter bottle and you can cut it in half. And so the bottom part of that two liter bottle, you can fill it with soapy water, and then you can flip the top half and put it upside down into the bottom half and it acts like a funnel. So when you see any beetles around in your garden, you can walk around and knock those beetles into your little funnel that you've created. And that soapy water in the bottom of your uh, funnel will actually kill the beetles. So then you're getting rid of all your beetles and you're not releasing all those pheromones attracting more beetles into your garden. So a really nifty tool um, to take care of all of those beetles. And for other pests, um, we recommend, or at least I recommend using a lot of natural deterrents for your garden. So things like marigolds, peppermint, lavender, things that have stronger odors to uh, ward off any other critters that wanna come into your gardens. And also on our SparkY website, we have many, many more uh, gardening tips. We just wanted to hit on a few major ones here in this uh, presentation. So we'll continue on and hand it off to Kate. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks for all that wonderful information. Um, wonderful, okay, so for the play of drawing, 
Um, we have had seven schools enter in, and it just so happens that we have enough plants for seven schools. So, um, you know, not as exciting as see, you know, you guys watching me draw, but all seven schools will be receiving plants. So that is Anthony Middle, uh, Howe Elementary, Seward, Bancroft, Anderson, Washburn, and South. Um, so congrats everyone for your plants. Um, again, you will all be getting a variety. Um, it'll be a tray with a mix of different um, vegetables and herbs. There's some tomatoes, Swiss chard, um, cucumbers. You can see here that they are some nice size. Um, I'm currently caring for them in my yard uh, to make sure they come to you fully hydrated. Um, so, Again, a nice variety. We will be um, delivering them to your schools tomorrow. Um, and you'll be getting an email from me um, just shortly after this, this webinar um, where you can just let me know where you would like the plants dropped off. So um, I, I think I know generally where all of your gardens are, but if there's specifics about, you know, if you want them left near your shed or something, um, you can reply to that email by noon tomorrow with those details. And then we will drop them off for you tomorrow afternoon um, and we hope you enjoy them. So thanks again to the city of Minneapolis and to Spark Y for helping to donate those plants for all of you. Um, and thank you to all these schools for joining us today. Um, I'll hand it back over to Spark Y. Awesome, thanks so much, Kate. And congrats everybody that got plants, that's amazing. Um, we're gonna do a little question and answer section uh, now. So if you do have a question, feel free to uh, use your mouse and go to the bottom of your screen where it says participants and another screen will pop up. And on the very bottom of that screen there, it says raise hand. So if you click the raise your hand button, um, a little hand will show up next to your name and we'll know that you have a question to ask. Uh, so when we call your name, you can click the unmute button and ask your question, which is in the bottom left corner of your screen. And if you don't feel comfortable asking your question either in the chat or on this recorded uh, platform, feel free to email me. My email's right there, caitlin at sparkwhite.org, um, and we'll get your questions answered for you. Oh, and actually, while we're doing Q&A, Nick, I think, has one more uh, poll for us that we can answer. So if anybody has a question, feel free to ask it, and Nick will pull up this poll for us. On a scale of one through five, how helpful was this presentation? And this just helps us figure out if our content was actually useful and uh, to make it better for next time. Kate has a question. Lovely, Kate. Feel free to unmute yourself and ask it your question. Okay, great. So um, this is a question inspired by my own garden at home. Uh, maybe other people have experienced this this spring, but um, my rhubarb has been flowering, which um, I have never had my rhubarb flower before. Um, so I'm curious what the best thing to do is when flowering. I went ahead and I did pull off the flower the first time. And then just yesterday, there was another one there again. Um, so I'm wondering if you have any tips um, about if you are to remove the flower, you know, do you just pull off the flower or do you, pull, you know, cut it down farther closer to the base for that like tall stem? Um, or if I wasn't supposed to remove the flower, you can tell me that too. Um, but I'm just curious to hear a little more because um, it's not something that I'm really familiar with. Yeah, great question. And actually, I just started growing rhubarb. I think last year I planted it, and this year it's a small, tiny little plant. So I'm not the most expert on rhubarb, but what I've heard is that you are supposed to pull those flowers off so that the plant can focus on its leaf and its stem growth. But apparently the flower growth doesn't really affect the leaves or stems at all. So you can pull them off if you really want to harvest your stems from your rhubarb. Otherwise, if you're not really that concerned about the production of the stems and the leaves. Um, you could leave it there just to be kind of a pretty little thing that happens. Um, but since you bring up rhubarb, I just learned something else about rhubarb too. Apparently, um, if it freezes and rhubarb is out in the freeze, uh, it can cause, I'm not sure how it works, but some sort of something gets transported in the plant and it can be toxic if um if any of the leaves have been damaged so if you have your rhubarb outside in a freeze or a frost uh just inspect the plant before you go and harvest it and if the leaves have any brown edges or anything like that um you're supposed to pull the 
the stem from the stock and just discard those ones. Um, but any new growth or any growth that was unaffected by the freeze is still absolutely edible. So interesting fun fact. I hope that helps answer your question, Kate. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else has other questions or even any other information to share? That would be wonderful. Hi, this is Kira. Hi, Caitlin, too. Hi. And thank you for the, the gift of this presentation and the, the plants. Super excited about that. Um, I have a question particularly about Bee's Friend. It's a plant that I planted indoors um, and it's popped up really quickly. Um, and the seedlings are pretty, um, they look pretty weak. So I don't know when is a good time to transplant um, that pollinator plant that it would do well outside? Yeah, great question. Um, from what I've heard, so most pollinators and natives, especially if they're native to Minnesota, are pretty hardy. So I would say that anytime since we are after that May 15th kind of average last frost date, I think it would be good to put them outside now. Or even if you have the option, um, they say the plants that are started indoors should be hardened off before you bring them outside, um, which basically just means bringing them outside for a couple hours every day while they're still in their little planting pot and then bringing them inside overnight. Um, and that just kind of gives them a little bit of stress, honestly, which will acclimate them to the uh, environment, which is outside. Um, so I would maybe do that. Maybe start with like, you know, four hours one day maybe six hours the next, increase it by two hours every day until you're up to like maybe 10, and then plant it outside in your garden. But the reason maybe that you're seeing that it's not doing super great indoors, we've, we really love to try and plant things indoors with our students, and a lot of the time at our school programs, they don't always have all the supplies, you know, like indoor grow lights and whatnot to make it a really successful opportunity. And we've, we've, we have noticed that when we don't have the grow lights and we don't have, you know, a south-facing window necessarily to put it in, um, they don't do the best. They get kind of leggy and kind of sad looking. Um, so if you do have a grow light that you can put on it while you've got your plants inside, that would be really great for them. But it is a good time to start transplanting things outside. So I would say um, hopefully it'll survive if you, if you bring it outside soon. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, let's see. I don't know who SUPET001 is, but you can ask your question. That's me, Susan. Um, um, so my question about, you know, normally when I plant zucchini or squash, you know, I get tons of um, plants, and this is more at my house than at school, although I think it's happened at school too, where the, I don't know if it's the vine borer or what, what is getting in there. Um, I'm wondering what's the best way to deal with that? Great question. So yeah, I've also had that issue with um, with squash and zucchini. I One time I planted this beautiful patch of it. It was growing, it was gorgeous, and then one day it was all gone and it like completely died. And it's so frustrating when you get those kind of scenarios. Um, my biggest advice would be try to rotate your plants every year. So if you have that one spot in your garden where you really like to plant cucurbits like squash and zucchini and you know melons and that kind of thing, uh, try to move it to the opposite side of your garden next year. Because um, any sort of pathogen or pest or disease sort of that was in the soil from last year, it might still be living there. And so rotating your crops can help. Um, I guess specifically with the, the um, stem borer, I'm not exactly sure what the best course of action with that would be um, to get rid of it. But if anybody else on here has some thoughts or ideas and wants to chime in and, and help us answer this question, that would be great. Otherwise, Susan, I will do some research for you and I'll get back to you with a better answer. All right, it looks like Christina McHenry has a question for us. Hi, yeah, I don't know if my video is on here, but um, two questions. One, we're planning on doing um, loofah plants in our community or our school garden this year. And then I didn't get the seeds early enough because it was really hard to get them that eggplant. And have I just missed the boat on that this year? 
So this year, uh, with the coronavirus and COVID, apparently everybody really got into gardening this year, and a lot of seed supply companies sold out or didn't sell out, but um, were really backed up for a really long time. And I think they are still a little backed up, but I have seen emails recently of um, True Leaf, I think it was, and Johnny's that are saying they're getting back in the swing of things and more on a regular schedule. So I think if you ordered from True Leaf or Johnny's, they would probably be able to help you out um, and you could still get seeds. Um, whether they'll still survive this year is another question. Um, yeah, it is right. A little, right. It's a little late to start things like peppers and tomatoes. Yeah. Um, but it's not at all too late for things, you know, like lettuce, uh, pea, beans, those kind of shorter season crops, even maybe, you know, kale or pak choy, uh, some of those things. I think you've definitely got, yeah, more, enough okay. time for those things. Um, and then piggybacking on kind of the last question that was asked about um, the zucchinis or the cucumbers. So if we planted last year some zucchinis and cucumbers in a plot, but this year, we're going to plant another viney thing like that, but it's not the same plant. Should we not be doing that? Is what, that what is the plant? Is it um, in the cucurbit family by chance? Uh, you... I can't. I can't. I can't remember exactly, what, but it's it's something like. I mean, say it's like watermelon. I don't know. So hmm, that's a good question. I would. I would usually advise people to separate it entirely and choose something okay. from a totally different family, like tomato. But since it is a totally different plant, it's a watermelon and not a zucchini, it might still be able to kind of, uh, you know, not attract some of those pests and the diseases that the zucchini did. Um, so switching it up like that is still great, uh, rather than just planting another zucchini there. Uh, but if you do have the opportunity or the chance, um, I, would, I would recommend trying to put something else like a tomato or a, what else, maybe a brassica like kale or broccoli or something in that space instead. Okay, and then wait three years until we plant the cucumber there again? Not necessarily three. I usually rotate it every one year. Three years is a really safe bet, so that's a good, a good estimate. Um, okay. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Any other questions out there? It looks like we got to all of our raised hands. Um, just to oh. jump in, there was a question in the chat about um, what are some great plants with student interest uh, that harvest in the fall? So yeah, great question. So yeah, that's absolutely good. So we've had, um, I know that the MPS crew, when they're taking students through um, on tours and field trips, they'll often harvest like, you know, kale and uh, tomatoes and cucumbers and use that to make a little salad, which is really fun to get the students involved with and, you know, get them creating, creating something culinary and using creativity. Um, I don't know if this would necessarily be recommended, but I really like to grow um, hot peppers. And it's fun to talk about. It's fun to, you know, create a little hot sauce out of. Uh, it does obviously create its own issues when you have hot peppers and, and students involved. Um, so you do have to be a little bit careful about getting them, you know, the, the rundown on safety. Um, but this year, so this year at the CWS Garden, we're also planning to plant some things like um, ornamental corn and okra and sweet potatoes and have a conversation about how those can be kind of culturally relevant plant species and kind of where they originated and how they were brought, you know, to us and what kind of culinary dishes that they can be involved in. Um, so that's another cool kind of fun way to get students involved and get them asking questions and interested in what they're growing. Another really fun thing I like to grow, I'll just plug this quick, um, are ground cherries, which are kind of a half of a combination of a grape and a tomatillo. They're really a very small, um, almost, yeah, grape-like thing, but it's in a little like casing. It's in so when you have a plant like that, they produce just hundreds and hundreds of them, and you can just pull them right off the vine, peel back that little uh, shell, and then eat them right away. And they, they have that sweet flavor, almost like a grape does. So those are kind of fun to, you know, teach kids how to enjoy vegetable produce or garden produce right out of the garden, which is fun. Let's see, it looks like there's a couple more uh, chat questions. Oh, what do you use them in food-wise as far as the ground cherries? That's a good question. Um, I always just eat them uh, myself, but I suppose you could use them in anything that you might use a grape in. Like, um, I know a lot of people make uh, chicken salad and put grapes on their chicken salad. It would be really good in something like that. 
Um, you might be able to make a jam out of it. I haven't tried, so don't quote me on that, but it would be kind of fun to try. Um, and then one of them says, my students are always in awe of pulling up carrots and digging potatoes. That's a really good one. It's true. They're fun. It's fun to see, you know, their expressions when they see some actual plants growing on the roots. So that's good. Um, and also fun are ground cherries because they come in their own wrapper. Yep, that's exactly why we like the ground cherries too. If I could jump in too, Caitlin, um, as far as like root vegetables that are super fun to dig up, onions are another really great one because things like Caitlin mentioned already, tomatoes and peppers also tend to um, be super bountiful and harvestable in the fall. And a project that I love to do with my kids around that time as like a first big harvest project is salsa. Whoops, looks like we lost Sarah. <laughs> But salsa is a really fun one and we've done that before too. It's, uh, it's great to have like a little salsa garden or even a little pizza garden that you can plant and it's really just, you know, onions, garlic, tomatoes, and maybe some peppers. Um, and then you can go out there and harvest that with the students and do a little, you know, preservation and canning lesson, which is always really, really fun. Pickles is another one, of course. Or even like pickled okra or pickled um, beans or peas. It's always fun. And it looks like we had another question from Jacqueline. Hi, um, I'm gonna, it's kind of loud, I'm outside, so I'm gonna try to, um, to see if you can hear me. Um, I'm, start, I'm kind of starting from scratch with the Anthony Garden because the teacher who used to run it is gone now. Um, and he used to always germinate, can you still hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He used to always germinate the seeds kind of like around April with the kids inside and then they would plant the seedlings or the plants um, as they got bigger. And we have like a handful of plants and seedlings we can kind of keep growing and try to plant. Um, but I just don't really know, can I plant any seeds in the garden directly in the garden beds or can I only plant the ones that have developed a little bit? That's a really great question. So the ones that you already started inside, I would definitely transplant those, you know, little seedlings outside because they're already growing and you get a little jump start on it. But yeah, there's tons and tons of things that you can plant directly in the garden. And some of those would include um, peas and beans, definitely lettuce. Sorry, my phone's going here. Um, carrots are another really good one. And um, let's see. Onions, if you've got onion sets, which are like a little onion bulb, uh, you can plant those ones directly in the garden every so far, every couple inches, um, rather than the seed. Maybe not the seed, but the bulbs are great for onions. Um, and same with garlic, you can plant garlic in the fall um, and plant the garlic bulbs. Um, what else? Beets are usually a really good one uh, to plant directly in the garden. Um, let's see, bok choy might be a good one. Um, so pretty much anything that's kind of a shorter season crop that doesn't need to be started before the first frost or before the last frost date to get that full um, season in it, um, that can be started in the garden. If it only takes, you know, less than, I would say, less than about 70 days to reach maturity, then you can start it outside still. And if anybody else has other ideas about plants that you can start in your garden, feel free to, to jump in and let us know. Great question, thank you. All right, I'm not seeing any other questions here and it looks like we're at about one o'clock. Um, but if you do think of any other questions, feel free to email me, uh, caitlin at sparkwhy.org. And again, I will be posting this uh, webinar online on our website and I'll send an email out to everybody uh, that signed up through the Google form, uh, just to share that link with you guys. And thank you so much for joining us. It was really great to learn, you know, a little bit more about you guys and, and share some information with you. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye.